Okay. <laughs> All right. So good morning, everybody. I'm really, really so pleased to see a nice group here with us in Woodland Park. And hello to all of our Berkeley friends, colleagues, and associates who are tuning in virtually from all over the place. So welcome. Um, I'm so pleased to, um, I, I first have to thank everybody for coming here this Tuesday. Last Tuesday, we had the threat of a weather event. And depending on where you were living, you did experience a weather event. And some people didn't experience a weather event. So thank you again, everybody, for, for joining us. So um, I'm Michael Iris. I'm the Associate Vice President for Alumni Relations and Career Services here at Berkeley College. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Maurice Barrett to campus today um, as our alumni guest speaker from the class of 2012. He'll be covering the topic of um, unconscious bias in the workplace and how, what can be done to eliminate it. So a very, very timely topic, timely discussion relevant to um, all different areas and backgrounds. So we're really excited to welcome him here today to campus to share his insight. Um, just want to mention that this event has been co-sponsored by the Office of Alumni Relations, as well as the Berkeley College Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Um, I do want to recognize our committee chair is here today, Rachel Jaffe, and I also want to recognize Dr. Diane Racinos, our campus president, is also here today. So Maurice has over 16 years of international human resources management experience at the C-suite level with specialties in employee relations, labor laws, union specific dealings, career mapping, information systems, diversity, inclusion, accessibility, uh, recruitment and onboarding and strategic planning and implementation. So he has a very diverse background many years of experience working at multiple organizations focused on human resources management and recruitment. Um, in addition to this, he is also a senior consultant with the National Center for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion since 2010. So he's been a player in this landscape for many years now. So we're so fortunate to have him as, a, as an alum and have him come here and share his insight with us. Um, in addition, he was our 2021 alum of the year so we were able to recognize him and honor him for his accomplishments at our commencement ceremony in 2021. Um, again, I can go on and on, but he can share his background expertise with all of you. Uh, it's such a pleasure to welcome Maurice here today, and I thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me and indulging me in what I hope will be uh, an exciting conversation. Uh, I'm standing. There was a table and a chair here, but um, I move around too much, right? So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those who I like to be engaged. I like to speak. Uh, Michael, thank you for um, setting everything up and being the facilitator. Uh, anytime Michael calls me to do events at Berkeley, um, I don't ask him any questions. I just say yes. Um, I know he's going to set everything up, and uh, he always does right by us. And uh, proud to be an alum. Uh, Berkeley, and so that in and of itself makes me very happy to be here. <laughs> the The topic of, and thank you for that that welcome. The, the topic around, and 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 the title is eliminating unconscious bias in the workplace. But that's going to dovetail into the topic around DEAI, right? Diversity, equity, accessibility, inclusion. We can say belonging. We can uh, put in anti racism. But Michael is correct. When I began. The end of 2009 going into 2010, uh, it was only diversity. So it was the work of creating a more diverse workforce. And then came inclusion. It's like, okay, because you hire a diverse workforce, but here's what you come to realize. Any situation in which you are the only in a group, it's an emotionally violent situation. And so you can hire diverse individuals, but if you've had no experience um, in working with training, developing uh, those individuals, then, or <clears throat> the thoughts around unconscious bias and microaggressions, which we'll get into more in depth, then you have, we haven't pushed the work forward. And so inclusion, and then accessibility, uh, and then equitability uh, comes into play. Uh, and I say that to say the work that when I began as a volunteer 
all those years ago, it was flawed. It was early on. Uh, we understood as we were taking the work further that we had to be intentional, which is another topic we're going to bring up during this conversation. And so I, I appreciated Michael for pointing out when the work started to take root, because uh, as we all know, Michael also spoke to how timely this topic is. Uh, as we all know, things are very different now than they were in 2010. Uh, in 2020, and, and, and for those of you who have seen me speak or, or have been to a seminar um, that happened to be in the room or here virtually, first welcome, and secondly, you're gonna hear me say some things that you used to hear me say. But in, 20, uh, in 2020, we went through a health pandemic. Uh, but I like to make people aware also we went through a moral and a social pandemic as well. Uh, we saw things of the likes of which we had never seen as a society together. Uh, it doesn't matter the age, um, the access we had to this content made it so we could not ignore. Um, I can say at the time, my daughter was 14, my oldest was 14, 13 turning 14. And for a full week, she could not turn on a, a, a TV or go on social media without seeing something horrific happening to a certain group of people um, based on uh, ideology and, and so on. And it just tie that into the health pandemic and now organizations are in our living rooms and they're seeing our dogs, our cats, our children. The veil was off, right? And there's now no longer a disconnect between society and its progression and our professional progression as it relates to how we treat our humans. And so I think this is important to understand. And so when we speak about how timely it is, let's understand. I like to say that in 2019, 2009, 2010, when broaching this topic of just diversity, not DEAI, not DEIB, just diversity. I, I got a lot of expensive door slams about this. Mm -hmm. That topic was not something that organizations wanted to hear about. And, you know, it wasn't something we wanted to have the temerity to uh, dive into and walk that walk. Um, and so th th the precursor for change was 2020, right? In a lot of situations and not just opposed. 2010 was now, my LinkedIn's never been more active, right? Around conversations around DEAI, right? It's, it's understood. And with that said, we now have to not only pay attention to what we see in the mirror, now that we've put the mirror up, we have to do something about it. And so it means having meaningful, thoughtful, uh, conversations, transparent conversations, uncomfortable conversations, such as the one we're embarking on today. Unconscious bias is not rooted in anything heinous, right? Unconscious bias is just our brain connecting patterns, right? And really that is what it's derived from. Um, it sees information, it sees it in a pattern, it tracks a pattern and it says, this is what this experience should be like except when it comes to humans. It's hard to do that when it comes to humans. So now we're gonna to have to ask ourselves, what is pushing the information we gather around this pattern matching? And so we say it's social media, we say it's television, we say it's our upbringing. Pattern matching with humans is a conscious bias because if I have been through content, however I, I receive that content, however I decode that information, about a, a certain group of people thinking they are more prevalent to do A versus B in the workplace, that is unconscious bias. And so with intentionality, we must understand that unconscious bias is something we cannot control until we have knowledge of. But as that plays into the work of DEAI, it is something that we can be very intentional about. Make no mistake, these impediments that have been erected in our workplace, in the labor markets, they were erected on purpose. And so how can we get past it? How can we destroy, deconstruct these without intent, without purpose? And so we have to, as an organization, make the pledge from top to bottom that we are willing to hold ourselves accountable. And that's where the work of unconscious bias lies. We can't stop there, right? But unconscious bias and, and, and diving into the work of 
breaking down the precursors of and the actions related to and the work of undoing that harm uh, is very important. And, and we cannot push further the work of DEAI or a strong DEAI initiative without undoing the, the harm that this unconscious bias plays. And so our experiences, our culture, and our media plays a part in everything that we think and that, that data gets distilled. And that may lead us to make assumptions about every individual. If I, if I look in the room right now, there are three main areas in which I know that I'm going to identify. I, and I can't help it I, because I have unconscious bias as well. And it's going to be race, gender, and age. I just am. As I'm looking at all of you right now, and right now my mind is decoding all of it right now, and the three things that it breaks down right away I, is an assumption of each of you, and it's around three things right off the bat, race, gender, and age. And that's not, I, I wasn't just not because I was born a human being. No, these are constructs that we learn based on where we're from, um, our culture, our experiences, the media, um, the society at whole in which influences us. But if I take that into the workplace and I don't try to decode it in a way and distill it in a way that is not harmful uh, or I'm unwilling to do the work, then that is going to affect how I, how I perceive somebody's commitment versus another. That is going to affect how I perceive what a promotion will mean or who should be eligible for a promotion. Uh, who am I going to give credence to in a room where we have minds? Hopefully, we have diversity of thought and we're not homogenous in our thought in that room. But if we are in a room, who am I giving deference to? Uh, whose ideas get heard? If I'm a decision maker, I have. I was raised by a single mother and an older sister. I have a, a beautiful wife, three beautiful daughters. I, every year I take a assessment, bias assessment. And my biggest gap every year is women. I, I can't, I can't explain that. I can just do the work to unpack it and, and, and try to make sure that I can govern my decision-making and how I process, um, my, uh, how I navigate situations in which I know. And now a part of it is, and, and let's understand here as a, as a black male, I may perceive that, perceive that my walk throughout through society is, 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 is tougher than most. And yet I have gained so much from the patriarchy. And there's the blind spot. And so if I'm being, if I'm sitting with the uncomfortability, uncomfortability of it, I have to understand that's where my bias comes from. Uh, so, when I, so when I'm in that room as a decision maker, A, do I have the right individuals in the room? Meaning, is there enough diversity of thought? Uh, these decisions we make, and, and make no mistake in leadership, every decision we make either furthers the disparity or shortens the disparity in equity, in equitability, um, in DEAI. And so in those decision-making situations, have we done the work? And it's intentional. So yes, it may add an extra layer to the work. But have we, have we taken on the responsibility? Have we had the temerity to say, um, all the right individuals are in the room? Let's make sure the right individuals are in the room to make, be able to make these decisions or impact the consequences of these decisions. How does work get assigned? Well, I assume, based on my bias, that if I have a team, and currently right, right now, uh, my, my team is quite diverse. My, my, my team of direct reports, but I, I, I refer to it as my team. Will I assume that a heavier workload is going to affect uh, the women on my team more adversely than the men on my team? 
And if I disperse that work unevenly, will I then say, well, in my mind, will I unpack it as, well, Tom is doing the bulk of the work because I signed him the bulk of the work, but Tom is doing the bulk of the work, so I know he can handle it. I know he can multitask. I've given him the opportunity to display who he is. I've met him where he is. I didn't do that with Sue because I'm, I'm, a, good, I'm a good guy. So I know that Sue has kids at home. And I don't want to put too much on her plate. I didn't give her the, the option to make a decision. I didn't ask the questions. I didn't sit with the uncomfortability of the conversation. I got into what I call the disease of doing. And so I met a fork in the road and I said, my unconscious bias says, well, Tom. And then so when it comes promotion time, it can't be Sue. She hasn't displayed enough. So it's got to be Tom. And, then, and, 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 and that is just one small way in which someone's implicit or unconscious bias can, can, can come to play. And there has to be, if we are, if I may, in, I spoke about leadership earlier. And in our leadership groups, if we're going to take this conversation seriously, then we must have the, we must do, we must make the pledge that we will have that diversity of thought. We will not let the uncomfortability of the situation make us want to quote unquote uh, kick that can down the road. We 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 should bring in subject matter ex experts that are going to push us, that are going to feed us new data. That'll take us from where we have data that's measurable to data that's actionable, and then we have to have the temerity to to, to, to commit to that action. Twenty six percent of uh, Fortune uh, one hundred companies have HR in their C-suite, which means, I'm, I'm terrible at math, which means 74% of them have no eye towards what their culture is actually saying at the C-suite level, which is directly connected to the board who holds the CEO accountable. So there's no accountability around how we treat our humans in our organizations. And I always say, if you work in human resources, you should love humans. Treat their, their, their journey through your organization with reverence. We call it a livelihood. It matters. And so if onboarding is important as offboarding, in between, in between, we must be working with our humans to develop them based on who they are, meeting them where they are. And we can't do that if we're not, if we're not having that, this, convers this frank conversation around unconscious bias. I have, there, there are two thoughts to this work. The first thought is, education and um, we can only reverse this to education and unconscious bias is a real thing implicit bias is a real thing and then uh how many of us are familiar with jane Elliot? she is one of the greatest <sighs> contributors to the work of of of, of dei and uh, anti-racism and she is a staunch advocate of um, decision-making and culpability around diversity, um, around anti-racism. She did the, I don't know if any, if any of us have seen it, but it, it started to make its rounds again post-2020. She did an experiment, the green eye, brown eye experiment, where she had her classroom, she's a, a lifelong educator, made a decision based on characteristics. And she used eye color as characteristics. And uh, you could see it was visceral, the reaction for those who weren't used to the decisions being made specifically based on those characteristics right off the bat. And so that's the second part. That is the second way to do this work, which is to, in real time, sit with the uncomfortability of what we've already learned or what we've already been taught with intention and so uh, i've had the pleasure of, of, of speaking with jane elliott twice in my life and i consider it an honor both times and i can say that she is not a, a advocate of unconscious bias training the first part she's a proponent of the second part which is sit rooted in the action that's been done to make this prevalent in our society and thus strip it from there. Um, she would tell me that 
I'm taking the softer approach to anti-racism. And so um, as it, it's good to be able to, to have someone of that ill know your work enough to, dis to disagree with some, some portions of it. Um, but I, I think of her today as I'm speaking about this because she would say we're not doing enough. We would wanna, we wanna train through it, but we wanna sit in why we were taught what we've been taught in the first place. Um, and that feeds into the, the, next, the next tangible step we can take as an organization. And, the, and before I get into systems and policies and procedures, let's understand that in decision-making, so our managers who are making these decisions, I, can, I just sat with the uncomfortability and I shared with everyone in the audience that I have my own bias. Not my own perceived bias. If, if you were to ask me, and uh, my lovely wife is sitting in front row. She knows no one matters to me more than, than my mother. Sorry. Um, if you were to ask me, oh, my gosh, I'm not only a feminist, I'm a womanist. And I know the difference between the two. And I can argue vehemently on it. And, uh, and all of my, all, every time. And it's not, and I'm going to be honest, it's not close. It's not close, the distance between what, you know, it gives you a, a, a breaks it down you know, your three biases and one between one and two and one and three, it's not, it's not close. That would have been the last thing I would have guessed. So understand if I'm saying that, then our managers, our leaders have this and have no notion that this is affecting their decision-making. So how can we um, expect that we can train through this if we're not doing this with full intent? One of the first ways in which this can rear its head in the day-to-day -day outside of the decision-making is, and I'm sure it's a term that we're, we're all now <clears throat> very well aware of, um, it's microaggressions, right? And some people will say, oh, this is new terminology. It is not, I can, I can show you that. Not only is this not new terminology, D, even though we didn't, we didn't call it this, but DEAI work has been around since the 60s, okay? On a, on a real level. Not only that, this terminology, microaggressions, has been around since before that. And, I, and I'll just ask, we have a live audience and, and, and we have a virtual audience. And so um, I, I will, unfortunately, I won't be able to, to, to ask our live audience, but I'll ask the live audience here. Um, ha, have you ever in your life felt that you've been stared at or objectified? Raise your hand. Majority raised their hand, right. Um, and I appreciate the young man who raised his hand as well. <clears throat> Um, have we felt in a situation that we've had our thoughts, our contribution minimalized? Raise your hand if you've been in that situation. Okay. Has anyone ever expected you to, to perform in an inferior way? Have you felt that someone's just expected less of you? Raise your hand if that's happened. Have you ever been condescended to? Have you felt you've been ignored or overlooked? All my progressions, right? All my progressions. Because in our in everyday society, this is not something that plays a part in, in top of mind uh, connectivity and communications with our peers. It is not something we dissect in um, what we choose to amplify in our personal relationships uh, when, when assessing their value. In the workplace, it, it's a problem because it affects decision-making. If I have a friend who I know is always late, when they show up at an anniversary dinner and they're 35 minutes late, I'm like, oh, there's Johnny, he's late. I know that's who he is and I meet him where he is and it's a, if, I have an employee who shows up 35 minutes late. It's, it's a completely different conversation, right? Um, and so we, we adjudicate conflict differently um, and, and through a different lens in the workplace. And so if we are not, we, we, we do not invest time in, in, in training for emotional intelligence. If you're not investing time in management training that ties into conversations around equitability, 
We're not investing time in having training around implicit bias. And we're not, and I, and I want to make this clear, we're not equipping our managers to actually manage humans. We have individuals who can be promoted for managing functions flawlessly. And then give them two direct reports and you'll see if they're really a manager. Managing a human being is a complex thing because human beings are complex. So what makes us think that, oh, well, this individual has sold the most in the last 10 quarters and they manage their portfolio excellently. Okay, great. Now they can manage a team. And then you think you're equipping them with the tools uh, without teaching them how to manage humans. And with humans um, comes that implicit bias, that, that, that unconscious bias that, that we have to remain diligent and being able to manage and train through. Make no mistake, uh, bad manager hires a five-year mistake, right? And so who are we hiring? How are we training? What are we focusing on when we're training? And then how do we tie, the, what I want to get into is how we tie this work into what we do every day. But our strategies have to come from our managers and, and, and who, again, they have more impact than, 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 than sometimes we understand in senior, senior leadership. Uh, they're communicating every minute of the day, or they should be, with, uh, generally speaking, the bulk of our humans. And so they have the most impact. So what would, what would a mistake look like? And what would be the damage caused if one of these managers has a, an error caused by implicit bias or unconscious bias? And how proactive can we be in ensuring that those things don't happen? And by every, in, in every metric, every metric, uh, when you speak about productivity scales, efficiency scales, the more diverse organizations are the more profitable. But you can take a, a, a you can split it even further. The those who have a formal board level formal uh, initiative around equitability, diversity, inclusion are 10 times more productive or it's, it's, it's eight times, I'm rounding up, I'm sorry, um, eight times more productive than even those um, organizations who are diverse. So I'll break it down with names that we know. So Uber, Starbucks, uh, Google, big pushes in the last seven years to become diverse. Now their top levels, they are more diverse than Lyft, Microsoft, so on. Actual work, board level, actual um, dedication to pushing the, 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 the work forward, who report out on anti-racism, that is the next column. They are less productive than um, the Dunkin' Donuts and so on and so forth. So it, it, and I know that some of us have heard those organizations' names in the news around this very topic. And that's why automatically they come to mind because they weren't proactive. Um, those are the ones that you get a call from as a consultant after it are, it, it, uh, things have already taken place. Um, it, 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 is, it, is, but it is solving for someone who has put a Band-Aid on an issue and now they want you to diagnose and treat a larger issue. And so if we know that this is what plagues our management, if we know that um, implicit and unconscious bias plays a role in every decision we make, and we know that every decision we make either furthers that disparity or shortens that disparity, not only in trust, but in DEAI, then we must then invest in actual training around DEAI, around unconscious bias, uh, around belonging and, 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 and inclusivity. Uh, it starts with how invested are we? So do we have a recruiting funnel? If we have a recruiting funnel, do we actually break our data down based on dem demographics and, on, and then based on hiring manager? Does a specific demographic get to a certain hiring manager and get to the next step of the process a certain amount of time versus another set? 
That's an important distinction. So how much work are we willing to invest in the process, right? And so are we making a pledge? If we're homogenous at our leadership level, if we're homogenous at our directorship level, are we making a pledge that whether it is through uh, promotions or whether it is through um, going into the, the labor pool and, and, and bringing in someone from, from external, are we making a pledge to, to make sure that our hiring practices are, are, are equitable? For that? And then, and then, are we willing to take that extra, extra step and say there will be this will be a diverse candidate pool? If we make a higher senior leadership level, the candidate pool will be a diverse one. Are you are you willing to make that pledge? But if you are, then you have to do the next part of the work because diversity for the sake of diversity pushes the work backwards, and that's where the unconscious bias training, the equitability conversations have to come in and have to play a part in your everyday decision making and your everyday policies and procedures and how you not only view and act, but how you adjudicate uh, these issues as it relates to your culture. It's going to be different um, depending on your culture. If we cannot have this conversation within our uh, decision making rooms, then we will not end up doing the real work of creating recruiting funnel investing in ERGs, employee research groups. Do your, do your individuals have a voice in your organization? Do they feel that it's a safe space to have conversations in your organization? Create the ability and the access to employee resource groups where there's cross-functionality and not, no silos, right? Cross-functionality in some of these areas, whether it is a employee resource group around uh, adults 50 and older, uh, individuals living with disability, uh, Black and African American Studies uh, uh, ERG, uh, uh, Latin Latinx ERG, and it can it can run the gambit. How 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 detailed is your and and tied to your vision and mission is your training and development path? Do you have conversation? Do you have training management training tied to this? And is it tied to their accountability, which should be tied to your strategic initiative? Right, these, these are important and meaningful steps we need to be able to take. Do you have a, a DEAI, a DEIB committee? Do you have trusted facilitators who are willing to help do this work? Because this is additional work. Have you built out a program of uh, professional development where it is taking criteria that, that is uh, deemed equal value and allowing for not necessarily a round robin way of deciding who and when gets professional development, but finding a way to make sure that it's an equitable process. And so you're allowing the training and development to happen in a way that's stripped of bias. This is work though. This is hard work. This is, and just because it's hard, you know, just because it's hard doesn't make it impossible. I'm chuckling because I say this to my oldest child. Just because it's hard doesn't make it impossible. So how invested are we in, do, in doing this work? And then, and this works in, uh, this is apropos for where we are uh, at Berkeley. Education does it the best. There are equity frameworks that are built for professor, professors, teachers. And uh, in, these, in these very halls is where I, I, I saw... Um, Professor E2, I uh, believe it was in uh, business communications, one of them. And she showed me my first equity framework. And I thought at that time, why not apply this to people? So we can hold ourselves accountable for how we, this is such a naive thought, but treat people, right? Um, and I think that's brilliant. Uh, that that in, 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 in education, our equity frameworks built around uh, these steps and these processes to make sure that the, the data that is so important uh, that is transferred to the students um, is, is, is done in a way that that's, is not only manageable, but is equitable. And so the next step is accountability. And that's in a lot of ways how... Uh, Teachers are held accountable at the higher level. In our organizations, we need to build equity frameworks. We need to bring, build accountability measures. 
we need to uh, use smart goals to say, we yes, we want to be diver diverse, okay? Great. And, right, what is the next step? And when are we pledging to do this by? And what does this look like? The other thing is, to bring in a consultant or a speaker, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm against it, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> to bring in a uh, consultant or a speaker is great. Um, taking a step towards educating your staff, I think it's a wonderful thing to do. To not distill that information, synthesize it in a way that you can make uh, it affect your day-to-day, -day, your decision-making, your policies and procedures, uh, is 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 a is a is a misstep. You know, it's it's, and one thing I don't like is missed opportunities. I just think it's a very big missed opportunity. And so, if you are going to arm yourselves with information, then it should be in the. It it has to be in service of making yourselves subject matter experts. Me being here is okay, right? It, 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 it works, it serves, and we have uh, visibility. But what I can say about the connectivity in organizations that's different than here is I know that we have uh, a DEI chair that's in the room right now. I know that the work is actually in a formal manner being completed. Um, I've gone to places, I mean, ranging from farms in Texas um, to financial firms in Manhattan where the thought of some of the, the questions I get at the end are, well, we made a really big investment in, um, in, in DEAI this year. Uh, we just want to know what meaningful next steps are. And I say, okay, well, what'd you do? Like, we bought these three books and our directors read them and then we had a conversation about it. it was like that was Monday, and then what'd you do after Monday? Like what happened then? What? what? And they look, they look at me enough, and I to be able to know how much to invest in your work, you have to do the actual work of getting that data. Once you get that data, whether it's through a consultant, whether it's through any sort of professional externally, you must use that data to affect your decision making. Uh, ask the questions, sit with the uncomfortability of the answers. If you haven't engaged your organization in a uh, belonging survey, you've lost an opportunity. Sometimes on purpose, sometimes we don't want the feedback. We know it's going to be terrible. Um, if your organization is not invested in 360s, does not believe in 360s, I've heard that too. We don't believe in 360s. Great. Great, then you don't believe in communication. And no one wants to be involved in a place like that. So we have to be willing to hear some of these uh, nasty truths and that are going to always, more than often, speak to some, some of what we spoke about today around implicit or unconscious bias. If our conversations aren't continual in our organizations, then we're not doing the work of understanding implicit and unconscious bias. Meaning, onboarding is excellent. Your orientation last week, okay. And then they get thrown in and they learn what it, be, learn, it, it means to be a, a, an employee at your organization, a team member. And then you don't speak to them again unless it's around benefits time or there's an ER issue, employee relations issue. Sorry for the HR speak. Employee relations issue. You're not doing stay interviews? We only do exit interviews here. Oh, you only, ex you only expect people to exit. You don't expect them to stay. <laughs> no worries, I got you. If you're not doing stay interviews, you're not, if you're not a people-centric uh, HR uh, department or uh, people operations department, and you're not having these conversations continuously with your humans that make your organization what it is, then you're, 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 you're making a mistake, right? You're missing an opportunity. Uh, if you're not having someone visit with your departments, 
to distill the information that's emanating from the department to understand what does this say about us, whether it's an employee relations person or wherever else you want to deputize. We want to know what this data says about our culture. And how does that culture lead us to better decision making? There's a saying, right, that I, I say all the time, and I, I say that in all of you, and it's derived from a very special, uh, famous article, um, but culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I've been there, I've seen it where we've come up with the best laid plans and the best communication plan, and we just know how this is gonna land. And our culture is like, it, it falls on deaf ears, and our culture is saying to us, this is, this is not what we asked for. This is not, this doesn't jive with our culture and we are stunned in leadership. We are stunned. Well, because we haven't been speaking to anyone. We, 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 we view them as a monolith who are supposed to commit to X, Y, and Z and don't deviate because, and, and those antiquated ways of thinking, those antiquated views that should have gone out and, and, and through the multiple pandemics of 2020, uh, if we weren't going to do it then, when will we? Uh, there are some that are still pushing those integrated ways. I, I can't tell you how many how many times since between 2020 and now I've, I've looked over employee handbooks and it's still the same old integrated language. It's still the same old language around uh, profession, professional hair. Now, every, we, I know everyone here has a phone. Right? I can bet anyone in this room that if you were to Google right now, unprofessional hair, you get somebody that looks like me. Right now, I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now, I, there's not a doubt in my mind that that would happen. And yet in these handbooks, we're still seeing this conversation around uh, what, what professional hair should and, and, and would look like. And if we're not evolving with what society's doing, we're not evolving with what we know now to be true. And maybe we've been fighting knowing the truth as organizations and we will never be seen as, as a progressive organization. We will never actually be able to keep the humans within our organization happy or content or productive or morale high and they will leave. And it, it's gonna come back to poor management. And like I said before, bad management hires, bad, bad manager hires a five-year mistake. But if you're not, if you don't care about the training and development of humans, if you're not investing in this work, those managers will they will make these mistakes. Those individuals will become aggrieved and those individuals will leave. And those who stay are generally the perpetrator. And then so you have a uh, culture of perpetrators and then you want that to be sustainable and it will not be sustainable. You'll call people like me to come in um, to, ask them, <laughs> to assess your culture, and um, you, you, won't, you won't like what you hear, right? Um, and so if you're not invested in, invested in those ways in a meaningful way, as I kept saying after each one of them, you're missing an opportunity. And so if you go from having those stay interviews, distilling that information, yes, unfortunately, people transition away from us. We have those exit interviews. What does that say about us? How many surveys do we do we invest in for our organization? And then what do we do with the information? Because essentially, when we invest in a communication system and we connect with our organization with our humans, we're it's a contract. We're saying, tell us what you need, what you see, what's happening. And the assumption is we're gonna do something about it. So just tell us. And so I'm like, okay, I go into these organizations and I ask them, when did you do an employee engagement survey or a belonging survey? And they're like, oh, oh, glad you asked. Did one last September. Great. What was the feedback? And what did you do? And they're like, we haven't, we haven't quite gotten around to that yet. Okay, so what you said was, come here, tell me what's going on. And they told you and you're like, cool, we'll talk about it some other time. And so what do you think that does? Do you think that engenders trust? Do you think now they trust you and your decision-making? And then you're like, oh, whenever we unveil something new and exciting, it never gets, picks up the speed we think it will. And like, they, they don't trust you. They don't trust you. They don't trust that you know enough about them to care. 
And I don't mean their personal lives. I mean, how va what the value that they bring. Again, for management. And so when you get that data, are you turning it, taking it from measurable and making it actionable? And then creating an action plan, making those meaningful steps, tracking the steps, synthesizing that, making it prescriptive. Yeah, it's hard work, but are you, if you're truly invested in the success, you will invest in this work. And so as we engage in yet another step to invest in what I, I, I term great HR, but what is going to uh, positively affect your morale and your employee base, it really is around the same things that push strategic initiatives in any other department, operations. I, I've said in more than one occasion how, uh, how important communication is, how you need to build accountability, communication plans, right? These are things that you would do with any initiative. Or for some reason, when we speak about DEAI, we think it's some sort of moral initiative. It is not. We need to build meaningful steps around it, build meaningful plans around it. And then we need to track it and see what it says about us and then pivot when we need to. And the final part is, for the best part, in executive leadership, uh, and I've been blessed enough to be a, a senior executive and, and someone who's in decision-making for uh, over a decade now. I can tell you unequivocally, and there are senior leaders in the room, and I'll know if you're lying. There's only one way we show we care about anything. And that's with budget. It's budget. Let me see your OTPS. I don't need to see your PS, your personnel. I don't need to give me your OTPS. And I, I will tell you what you care about right now. Anyone that's in business right now. So if you don't have a budget specifically for some of these initiatives, missed opportunity. And you're not doing the full work. And if you're just gonna, man, I'm an HR executive, so I'm not, I, I love, <laughs> I love my profession. But if you're just gonna tuck it into an HR department, shame on you. Don't just, don't just say, oh, we have, an, we have budgets from the events we threw last year in HR left over. It can take that $1,200 or something. No, you're not doing the work. You're not doing the work. Put, put budget to it. Find a way. There are grants there if you can't find a way internally. I'm telling you that there's work that can be done for your development departments through hopefully your DEI, your, your, your you know, DEIB committees. Do you have board involvement on that level? You know, oh gosh. This, my, my wife, she's sitting front row and she can attest to the the night's pacing and, and going through notes and getting ready for a pitch to a board around this topic. And so many times I expect this nuanced response at the very least, if they weren't going to actually make this a part of their initiative. And it's, ah, uh, we don't want to open that can of worms. You know, you know. I, I can, I'm, I, I promise I've never got, I have not once gotten one good reason where I was like, you know what, that makes sense. And and I and I'm only putting it that way because maybe it's just there's not a nuanced way to say it. We don't care. But I have not received one nuanced response to my, and I can I don't even know how long it's been, but I can talk for so imagine, right? Um and um, the response is a nice and tidy, yeah, let's kick that can down the road. Let's see it. <laughs> okay, right. How connected is your board to this initiative? And again, if if we are afraid to have this conversation, then there's not a safe enough space in your organization for this. And then that, that's a shame. That's a shame because you will need a lot of change in order to, to switch that around. A lot of change. That's a lot of poor management. That's a long time of poor management. And there's a lot of people being content with poor management. And so now that we're around to the budget portion, how are we putting budget to some of these initiatives? How can we, as an organization, in a way that makes sense or in a way that's equitable, I'm not going to say fair, in a way that's equitable, say, 
our initiative to uh, digitize our documents cost fifty thousand dollars. We had to build a conduit to tie it into Dayforce in order to be able to extract the data on a you know annual basis, and then say, and then on DEAI, we bought books, <clears throat> and then say that that's an equitable endeavor. It's not. And so we need to really be invested in this work. The title makes me chuckle of today, uh, eliminating unconscious bias because you don't you don't know when when you finish the work because the work's not supposed to ever be finished. This is supposed to be continual. You know, it, it's 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 it's. I can't speak to my CFO and say. Uh, that that budget forecast we we partnered on uh, first quarter, uh, that should that should hold us over for uh, the next ten years, right? We shouldn't have to have a conversation about this the rest of the year, right? No, we have budget reforecast for a reason, right? Things change, new data appears. We need to be able to hold ourselves accountable for moving in that direction. Starts with making that initial pledge. This work is hard. It's uncomfortable. Uh, it's now being. There are negative connotations now being attached to this work. You know, it was before, and then, you know, for age, thank you for aging me a little bit, Michael, but before, you know, 2009, 2010, jumping into this work, it was about not having the conversation. In it. And now, somewhere along the line, it's like discrediting the conversation. And so that's when you understand the work is actually moving things. Uh, so it's scary and good at the same time. But I will, I would like to say this. Every little bit matters. My very first formal diversity conversation happened in a printer room. Mail room. Mail room. Um, we huddled all, all the printer room because it was such a small room. The printer took up the almost the entirety of the room. And I kid you not, we were huddled to the right where all the plugs were, the printer having this conversation because the walls were so thin. And you know, it was around, oh, I read this book and it was so eye-opening and wow, could you imagine if there was some sort of committee here or there was some sort of eye towards making sure some of these things weren't being said or done to us in a way that strips us of our individuality. And safe spaces didn't exist then. So we created one in the mail. Um, there is a way. Uh, listening to your culture, listening to the humans that make up your culture is one of the most important steps because we didn't have a safe space so we didn't feel that we could escalate our feelings to anyone. So we just huddled in the mail room. And so we weren't able to affect change there, but the environment didn't allow us to. Foster that environment. If you're not doing open forums, you're failing. If you're not doing monthly all staffs, they don't know anything about what you're doing. You may think the quarterly ones are doing something, they're not. If you're not insisting your managers are having at least week, uh, bi-weekly one-on-ones, if not weekly one-on-ones, you're, you're making a mistake. If your performance appraisal process is not clear and transparent and is not tied to an overall compensation strategy that's equitable, then you're hiding from work. <laughs> If your strategic initiative and your accountabilities as a senior leader is not tied to retention and engagement at any level, you're hiding from the work. Your, your, your decisions have consequences. So poor managers make people leave. The biggest reason people leave is because of their managers. When you ask them what about their managers that you didn't like, they always speak to the culture that they allowed. People always think, oh, people are leaving and jumping and get money at their next job. First, if you can leave and get better money, okay, I guess that's, but the numbers are telling you with specificity, people are leaving because of terrible managers and terrible cultures. And these are some of the reasons, right? And implicit bias is 
plays a part in decision making at every level. It plays a part in every decision that's made. And so now at the highest level, your accountability, me aren't, your accountability measures aren't tied to at least in part two, retention, engagement. Then you're not A, <laughs> you're not being held accountable to listen to your humans. And then B, you, you're not being held accountable to do anything if you do listen to them and they say something. And that's great, I guess, if you want to be disengaged from your organization and you think in some way that is going to make you a leader in your industry or an employer of choice. But there's no way of being a meaningful leader without transparency, vulnerability, and having a servant leadership mentality, which means you have to start with the humans that are doing the work. Those conversations have to happen. You have to foster those conversations. And so let's go back to the 26% of uh, Fortune 100s, right? I have a, a, a people manager at the C-suite level, an HR person at the C-suite level. That's a way for us to hide, right? From the decisions we make every day that affect our humans, right? Accountability measures are important. Building a strategic initiative around this are important. The, the rubrics with which you are going to chart your progress is important. I always say communication is a response we get back. Right. Other than, otherwise, we're just talking at, at each other. Communication is a response we get back. When you ask for feedback from your, your employee base, expect raw feedback. Okay. Sit with the uncomfortability of it and then do something. If we're not asking the right questions, we're hiding from it. So if you have an employee engagement survey, you should have a full section dedicated to belonging and how we feel we're doing around diversity. Belonging and diversity. We can say belonging because in some ways that can enca encapsulate the, uh, the equitability portion, but I will make this clear. Diversity, equitability, accessibility, and inclusion should be thought of in every decision-making process. And so when you're looking for a solicit, when you're trying to solicit that feedback, and I don't care if it's as, as streamlined and easy as SurveyMonkey, or you're going out there and getting a big consultancy consultant firm to get this feedback. You better make sure you're asking the questions around your culture as it relates to DEAI. Because those, those are the answers we're afraid of in senior leadership. And trust me, we are not shocked when we see that, um, oh, they, they just, they don't want to see or hear that we want more money. No, 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 we know. That's the, that's the constant that comes up. We know, finan you know financial ac access to financial freedom is what, what drives our uh, human beings in the, in the workforce world. But that's not the thing. Please, it's not the thing. There are many times where I have cautioned CEOs against, listen, no spot bonus in this situation. Let's have the conversation here. And then you have the conversation, and I kid you not, in one situation, there was this whole, that we had a meeting. We were thinking of diverting funds to open some budget to do this big spot bonus. <laughs> to avoid this conversation, uh, because we knew we were not going to be able to give them what they wanted at that moment. And we didn't say, we weren't responsibly transparent enough to say, at this moment, we can't do this. Mm. What in between now and when we can, third quarter, when we can, what can we do to show you we value you and add value to you, to you being here? Those two things. Just ask those two things. Didn't do that. Instead, we said, right, let's see if we can do a spot. I said, okay, well, has anyone had a conversation with this individual? Well, the initial conversation and we didn't think, you know, okay, well, respectfully, could I have a 10 minutes, maybe 12 minutes? You know, thank you for being transparent. That's understand. I, I get it. Thank you for even thinking that I deserve that conversation and for saying that, you know, we're going to take steps and for having, for, for doing the work. Um, what, what would really help me is over here, it gets really, really bright during the day and it, it, it hurts my migraines. And I, I didn't want to ask John. You know, I, I didn't want to, you know, make it so he felt like he had to move me somewhere. 
So like, okay, no, no, no problem. We'll talk to, 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 to Canon facilities and we'll get a desk there and we'll move you over there. It's like, oh, really? Is it? Oh, thank you for listening. To Just have a conversation. You want to sit with the uncomfortability of the conversation. Now we have to take meaningful formal steps to actually do right by this employee. Yes, and we did. But the major to do from this conversation was moving uh, her seating arrangement. And she was ecstatic. We had a public feedback forum called Insights. And she posted in the, in, in, in the forum how she felt, she felt seen and heard. 12 minute conversation. How willing are we to do that, right? Um, and again, it's gonna go back to training. Your managers must feel equipped to be able to have those conversations because if they're not, they're gonna shy away from it. Problems are gonna build. It becomes a toxic environment. And then we're trying to do the work to re reverse what happened. So I'm, selfishly, I'm, go I'm going to say uh, out of the set tracking, I think it was eight areas that I went into around what we can meaningfully do. Selfishly, all of the work that we can do can make a, a difference. We can do everything I just said, but if we don't put budget to it, hold ourselves accountable for the decision-making and how that affects our organization moving forward, then we can only go but so far. The questions we need to ask ourselves and how we need to move forward from those responses, they're gonna differ based on your organization, but please make sure to ask the questions. Please make sure to understand that the feedback is not just vitriol that's meant to make you feel a certain type of way in leadership. It's responding to your request. It's upholding their end of the contract. You said, listen, if something's wrong, tell me. They tell you, you must do something. It's such, I hate this term. So I'll use this other term that I dislike almost as much, but it's a win, it's an easy win. Hey, if you see something, say something. Cool, hey, I saw something. Now I'm saying something, okay, I'm gonna do something. Easy one. Now they're like, oh, I trust you because I told you something and you did something. Now, all of the time, it is not the action of doing what they want. I ask two questions. I, I distinguish between what kind of conversation we're going to have in my office by, by saying this one thing. Are you decompressing right now or are you activating? I can take meaningful formal steps in either way. But if you're just decompressing, I'm here for that as well. We can decompress. I can give you some pointers and walk you through what maybe your next step should be, something you can sleep on. Are you looking for me to help you? Because I never want to get in that disease of doing. I want to sit with the conversation and make sure we're understanding each other. And so please, let's, let, let's be cognizant in how we can affect change through leadership, how we can hold ourselves accountable in everyday decision-making, how we can ask the right questions in our surveys and feedback forums, and then take the response in a manner that is productive. Distill that and create something prescriptive that we can use to better our organizations. As close to the, the as close as we can get to a constant conversation is, is what I would ask of senior leadership with their organization. As close as you can get to an ongoing conversation where they know exactly where to go for a feed, and, and there must be a feedback loop, right? That's another thing. Let's, let's, let's make sure we have a feedback loop there where information comes in from one end and we turn that around on the other end. Continuous conversation. All of the formal initiatives I spoke about, they sound great and they are great. Communication. Communication. And, and remember, communication is the response you get back. So if your communication didn't land, if you get a response to something you said or wrote or disseminated in any way, and you are surprised by the response, then you didn't communicate. You spoke. That's not communication. It's the response you get back. So now that response is telling you, uh -uh, try again. Decode this, code this information differently because I'm not decoding it in the way that you think I should. It's important to understand that. 
I coach uh, kids from six years old through high school and softball, young ladies from all different parts of New Jersey. So I'm from Pennsylvania. I can say the same thing in a group of them and all of them will decode it differently. I have to be cognizant of that. It's important. I care enough, so I do the work to understand each of their communication mechanisms. How they communicate. I distill their communication mechanisms in a certain way as well. I make sure I pick up on cues, verbal and nonverbal, and support. So make sure your managers are plugged in. Yes, again, these form formal initiatives we went over, they're important. Communication, training with your managers, making sure they know how important communication is. Not just speaking from a place of authority, using and abusing their power dynamic. A constant, constant communication, constant feedback. And if that's not happening, then you're being remiss in, in senior levels of management. Allow for your mistakes to be on display as well. Be vulnerable, understand, and explain this didn't work, so we're pivoting here. Another quote-unquote easy one, right? And, and, and that's vulnerability and leadership. And if we're serving leaders, I know is a big, big thing here. Um, and, and I agree with as well, and try to govern myself that way. Um, we want to make sure we take that along the process and communicate through every step as responsibly transparent as possible. Thank you. Thank you. So I know I have several thousand takeaways, and I, I the biggest one for me is as an educational institution. I think we have the responsibility to make sure that our students who as a career focused educational institution, yes. that our students are empowered and aware of all of this and know those questions to ask that you're that you're specifically saying, because I think from my perspective, a lot of organizations address this issue um, more so more recently, like you said, and it's only on the surface. Oh, our management team read a book. Isn't that lovely? Right. Oh, we did a survey. What did you do with it? Nothing. No. Okay. So it's. I, I think that that's so impactful. And I think our students need to be, my phone is ringing. Uh, my <laughs> students need to be aware of that. So that's my, my major takeaway, definitely. And I'm sure everybody else does as well. Do we have any specific questions or comments? Um, I know Kelly's monitoring the chat. Um, Professor Gray, you have? Sure, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Professor. I just wanted to say that I developed a DEI certificate at Berkeley, and we added two courses to two other courses we already had. One is managing uh, organizational bias, and the other one is creating an equitable workforce. And what's great about those courses is that just Berkeley students can take them. You don't have to be in a certificate, but I think a lot of students have really seen the value in those courses. So you know, the more we get the word about out about that, I think it's going to be great. Absolutely, that to add a certificate to the, uh, create a program and make that something where you're eligible to get a certificate is extremely important. I was uh, I was actually speaking with my manager uh, two days ago this week around a course I was taking at the University of South Florida, and they made it eligible for, you know, for you to get a certificate, and they formalized it, and in 2021, 750,000 people took the course, so what came next, they monetized it, right, so, <laughs> so they made it, so yes, you can take the course for free, but if you want the certificate, it's $100 to make it a course where it's eligible for a certificate, right, so you got $100 now, to, but it's so important to have that and, and make that, that discernment, have that distinguished uh, type of program, um, anything I can do to help, and I'll definitely get the word out um, okay. as well. Uh, yeah. Please, that's phenomenal. That's and you phenomenal. go on our website also, and I can send it to you after, but um, there's some great testimonials about this course. Oh, excellent. Yes, please, please. I will. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. Any other questions, or did anybody from our online? Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that there is unconscious bias uh, amongst Blacks with uh, facial hair during an interview? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, there, the spectrum, if we want to 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 call it that, um, or the gambit is is a full one. 
there is more of a, and there is a rubric that we use where uh, honest hiring managers have given this data and it says, what does, what does it say? Like, what do you see? Um, and it's characteristics and traits that are akin to aggressive, unkempt, not focused, you know, uh, lack of, uh, lack of seriousness or profession. And then you will show, uh, someone else, same type of, and then, um, you will see things that say distinguished. Like, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute, wait, I can't, I get distinguished. Uh, and so, yes, but I will say this, we spoke about our own gaps. My mother, because of the constructs that she was raised under when, when we came to this country, she believes some of those things. So when I stopped having my hair the way it was, quote unquote professional, she's like, I don't know. I don't know if that's the right move. Right now, to this day, she will tell me, you should change your hair. You're not worried. You're not concerned. Right? And it's, she has been conditioned that way. So yes, it's there today, for, for today. I made sure that I shaved, right? Right? I made sure that I shaved and not because of anything other than I wanted to make sure that this was taken with the seriousness that I thought it deserved. Also, Michael and I, we have this, this running joke about how I'm always dressed, <laughs> but even that's rooted in trauma, right? Um, I was always told you had to work twice as hard, you get half as much. I was told work for the job you want, not for the job you have. And I was told that you in a hoodie or you in casual wear is different than Michael in a hoodie or Michael in casual wear. And so from my very first day at a job that did not require a suit, guess what I did 20, yeah, over two decades ago, <laughs> I wore a suit. Guess who's never taken a suit off one professional day in their life? Even that's rooted in trauma. It means to become part of who I am, but I'm not, I don't trick myself or fool myself into thinking that not, that hasn't affected me either, right? And so I purposely tell my direct reports, my team, don't go my, by my example. Don't go by my example. I am going to manage you the way you are best, you, you best like to be managed based on how you get to your optimum efficiency. But yes, there is, and all this rooted in, rooted in prejudice. All of it is rooted in what we know it is rooted in. And, the only way to push that forward is for the change at leadership level to make that not a requirement. And as we spoke earlier about the employee handbook and what that says, the certain parts around facial hair and, 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 and um, professional hair, um, all rooted, all rooted in the same thing. And uh, I would say all a big, a big component uh, of, of uh, bias. <clears throat> Is there anything online? Or? A lot of wonderful comments online, but no questions. Okay. Um, thank you. So everybody good? So I can't thank you enough for oh, the course. thank you gift. Um, <laughs> to have you as an alum is definitely an honor and a privilege for us as an institution. So I just have to thank you. Love coming back. And we'd love to have you. And Thank you everybody for coming today yes. and, and thank you everybody online. Um, this was recorded, so we'll be able to share that with you. And I'll also follow up with the certificate program information with everybody that registered as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.